And there are many people today that, that believe that all that they're gaining in the world, the riches of the world, they are believing a fable. Believing that they will find contentment when in actuality they won't. The happiness, the riches of this world, as we know, is temporary. Which is why Jesus said to us that we should lay up our treasures in that which is again heavenly. It truly is sad how so many are missing out on contentment today. Now, as I said last week, there are many people in the world that believe that gaining the riches of this world they believe that their bank account, they believe that their pocketbook, they believe that their wallet, I'm not going to pull my wallet out this week for all of you. They believe what's inside it. All right. All right. They believe it to be the end all be all to life itself. That is the principle by which they live by. Now, along those lines, there are many people that do their very best to build up their wealth so that they can enjoy life. And then when their life is all over with, they can have enough built up to be able to pass down to their own. Now, with that in mind, what if I told you that there is another kind of wealth that should be on all of our minds, right. that should have our focus, come on, come on. that should be the priority of our life. Get it, get it. What if I told you that there is another kind of wealth that you should be striving to build up, all right. All right. that you should be desiring to stir up within yourself mm -hmm. and then be able to live by and then pass on to be able to impart to all of those that are around you. What if I told you that there was another type, another kind of wealth that you can live by and then impart? Would you believe me? And would you strive to gain that wealth? A few weeks ago, I was speaking to one of my barbershop brothers. All right. All right. I've known both all of my life. And we was talking about life. Mm -hmm. And this was a, I want y'all to understand, this was a conversation that, that he brought up. That right. This was something that he said. I had just sat down in the chair right. to where he said, Rev, I like, what, I like what you said in that last sermon. You know, he always say that. And then he said, Rev, I, I'm happy, I'm thankful, I'm grateful that I have found true happiness. I'm happy, I'm grateful that I have found contentment in my life. Right. And he said that he wished that others would, would do the same, that they could find it, mm -hmm. that they weren't so hung up on the grind and the hustle for what somebody else has. Right. Right. And so we went on to have a really good conversation to where I spoke to him and I said, you know, it's the unfortunate side effect of how, you know, we came from, we come from a people that didn't have. All right. And so many of us, we were raised to have, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Many of us, we were raised to go out and, and to get wealthy with the thought and the idea of being rich would solve a great deal of problems that we have. And so the unfortunate side effect is we live in a world today where there are many who are hung up on the riches of this world, mm -hmm. believing that the riches of this world is true wealth. When in actuality, the riches of this world ain't true wealth at all. Again, I tell y'all that there is another kind of wealth that we should be striving to, to gain. 
Many of us, we again live with a great desire to one day possess enough to be able to pass on to those that we may leave behind. Yeah. Some of us, we may begin to wonder after we hear what I have said so far in the opening minutes of my message for today, we may begin to wonder, well, is it wrong of me to, to gain wealth? Is it wrong to build up enough wealth to, to pass down as an inheritance for all of those that, that come behind me? Well, in the 13th proverb, in the 13th chapter of Proverbs, in the 22nd verse, we'll get an answer to that thought. We'll get an answer to that question. Mm-hmm. Where that proverb it states that it is good for one to leave an inheritance for their children to have. However, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon, right. he cried out in the first chapter of Ecclesiastes, he cried out, vanity of vanities, yeah. all is vanity. Yeah. Solomon, in that chapter, he pondered on the thought of how one generation passes away and another generation arises. Another generation, it comes. And along that line of thinking, he would go on to say in the second chapter of Ecclesiastes and in the 18th and the 19th verse, he said, I hated all of my labor in which I had toiled under the sun because I must leave it to the man who will come after me, the next generation. Then he said, he asked, well, who knows whether he will be wise or whether or not he'll be a fool. Mm -hmm. Then he said, yet that one will rule over all my labor in which I told and in which I have shown myself wise under the sun. This also, he said, is vanity. Mm -hmm. Now, these thoughts of Solomon, they are very interesting thoughts that he that he had. They can Mm -hmm. appear to be contradictory. They are an enigma. I've loved saying that word the past couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. They could be difficult for us to understand. His thoughts, they may make you wonder whether it is a bad thing to build up generational wealth. So with this in mind, I feel that we need to come to understand what true wealth actually is. And to do this, I want to take a look at something that Jesus said. All right. Who better to find out what true wealth is than, than Jesus Christ, right. the only begotten Son of God? Mm-hmm. Now, when Jesus, when he spoke of wealth, because he did speak about wealth, right. don't you understand that he always spoke about wealth from a spiritual perspective, not a worldly perspective? You see, Jesus, he never spoke of adding to yourself the riches that are of this world. You have probably heard it before how Jesus spoke about how the riches of the world, they will eventually rust. Mm -hmm. They will eventually tarnish how they eventually will be destroyed. Whereas spiritual wealth, spiritual wealth, Jesus said, is the treasure that are not stored up in worldly things, but those things which are of the heavenly. Now, later scripture, Jesus, he again, he spoke about wealth. When he spoke of himself being the true vine and the sincere believers being the branches that grow from him. You may recall that from those branches, Jesus said that holy and righteous fruit should grow. Jesus said that he appointed the believer to bear fruit, not just any kind of fruit, but holy and righteous fruit, which is long lasting fruit. So let me ask you this. Do you understand what it means to bear fruit that is long lasting? Do you understand what that fruit actually is? You see, the treasure or the wealth of the believer is the fruit that we bear. Do you understand what I mean by that? The fruit that you bear, it says something about your spiritual wealth. Mm -hmm. From Jesus' statement, I want you to understand that he also spoke about 
imparting your wealth to those that are around you when he said that the fruit you bear is long lasting again fruit. So not only did he say that you should bear fruit, he said that your fruit, it is generational fruit, generational wealth, if you will. So to go back to that proverb for a moment, where the proverb spoke about the inheritance of a good man, a good man is one that is holy. A good man is one that is righteous. You see, the inheritance of a good man, I want you to understand that it doesn't necessarily speak of one leaving behind just materials. Do you see what I'm about to get at here? You see, the proverb, I want you to understand, it also speaks to one leaving behind the wealth that remains in one's heart. The inheritance that the proverb speaks about is one that is of spiritual wealth. I want you to know today that money can't buy what lies in your heart if you have gained spiritual wealth. Money can't buy what you got. You see, I want you to understand today that what you have in your heart, if you have stored up spiritual wealth, it is greater than what is material. What you have in your hearts today, it is greater than the riches of this world. Do you believe it? Again, I tell you all today that there is a different kind of wealth that you should be focused on. There is a different kind of wealth that should be the priority in your life. There is a different kind of wealth that you should labor for to store up. And I tell you again, it has absolutely nothing to do with worldly riches. Are you all about gaining the wealth that I'm talking about today? Now, for those that may begin to wonder, well, how do I gain this wealth that you're talking about, Pastor? Let's let's focus on this for a moment. John the Baptist, I want you to understand that he gave us the starting place when it came to, when it comes to gaining this, this wealth that I'm talking about, true wealth. John the Baptist, he preached repentance if one truly desires to inherit the wealth that I'm talking about. John the Baptist, he said that you should repent if you desire to inherit the kingdom of God. You see, that's the wealth I'm talking about today. The kingdom of God. You see, repentance, that is the turning away from trusting in the way of sin. Repentance, I want you to understand today, that's the starting place if you desire to gain the wealth that I'm talking about. If you desire to gain spiritual wealth. Through repentance, in order to gain this true wealth, in order to add on to this true wealth here, I want you to know today that one must then put their trust in the Lord. Turn away from trusting in the worldly riches, the wealth that is of this world, and trust in the wealth that is of God. If you desire to gain the wealth that I'm talking about today, the wealth that can actually do something for you. Now, when you start out in your walk of faith, when you have repented, you'll find that your spiritual wealth that it will increase through something that all of us believers face. Mm -hmm. All of us believers, our faith is often tested, isn't it? As James said in this letter, when you go through trials and tribulation, Mm -hmm. which all of us, again, we all face, Mm -hmm. James said that you will learn patience. Mm -hmm. James, he said, you will learn to be patient and even more faithful as the trying the testing of your faith, it will increase your faith in the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but through all those trials and tribulations that I have gone through, I have gained something. 
We say, in all of my trials and all of the tribulations that I have gone through in my my young life, it's still somewhat young life. I ain't got no yet. I have gained wisdom. I have gained wisdom. I have gained knowledge. My trials and my tribulation, they have increased what I know. Not what I think, but what I know of the Lord. And all that I have gone through, and all of my aches, and all of my pains, I have seen what God has done for me. And it has built up my knowledge, my trust Mm -hmm. in him. And I know that I will overcome. I know that I will persevere. I have that wisdom. I have spiritual wealth today. So I want you to understand today that when we talk about spiritual wealth, when we talk about true wealth, we're speaking of faith. We're speaking of knowledge. We are speaking of wisdom in the way of God, knowing what God can do for us. Through our faith, our wisdom, our knowledge in the Lord, we trust in him. And because we trust in him, we are blessed. We are highly favored. We persevere. We overcome throughout life. See, again, I want you to understand today that with our spiritual wealth, Mm -hmm. we live a prosperous life. And again, I want you to understand, I ain't talking about financial assets here. I'm not talking about material possessions here. I'm talking about heavenly riches here. Mm -hmm. As the writer of the book of Hebrews wrote, when we are free from covetousness, when we are free from the love of worldly riches, We gain something that's very important. We gain contentment, peace of heart. And I tell you all again, as I have told you all before about peace of heart, there ain't nothing in the world that's better than that. When you have the peace that God gives you in your soul, that is true wealth. But sadly, there are many that struggle to gain the wealth that we have. They can't find peace of heart. They can't find contentment. And the reason why they can is because they're high, they're, they're searching for it in the wrong places. They're going over here. They're going over there and they can't find true wealth, the wealth from the Lord. And because they can't find it, their soul is in a place of misery. They dwell in misery all of their days, unless They are led to the Lord. So when you have gained wisdom, when you yourself, the believer, have learned how to persevere, when you have learned how to be content, Mm -hmm. when you have started to store up that spiritual wealth, I ask you today, should you sit on it? See, to to sit on your spiritual wealth would be to sit down on God's assignment that we saw that the Lord has assigned that he has tasked us in my sermon last week. To do that would be to go against his assignment. To do that would be to stand against the values and the principles that the Lord has set for us to live by. And so I ask you today, if you have stored up some spiritual wealth, Are you living by the principles and the values that the Lord has set for you? Are you again, as I said last week, are you being obedient to God's assignment for you? So with that in mind, I want to share some background scripture with you today from the books of Deuteronomy and Judges. And the reason why I want to share some background scripture from the book of Deuteronomy and Judges is because there is a danger that is presently growing in our world today that I feel that I need to speak on here. In the 
sixth chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, we come across scripture where Moses was cautioning the children of Israel about forgetting the Lord. Moses, he said to the children of Israel in the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy from the 12th through the 15th verse, you'll see where he said, beware lest you forget the Lord. He said to them, you shall not go after other gods, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. I want you to highlight those words. I want you, I want us to heed those words today. Listen to these words. Sadly, the children of Israel, they didn't listen to those words. They didn't heed the caution of Moses. They didn't heed his cautions. They didn't heed Joshua's as well. Joshua had a message that was similar to Moses. You see, Joshua, he encouraged the children of Israel to serve the Lord. He encouraged them to serve the Lord and don't go out serving idols. But again, Moses and Joshua words, they fell on deaf ears. Their words, I want you to understand today, came from a well of spiritual wealth that they had stored up on their journey throughout life. Those words, they should have been heeded by Israel. But again, sadly, scripture shows us that after the death of Joshua and the generation that entered into the promised land, the second chapter of the book of Judges and the 10th verse tells us that there was a generation of Israel that rose up and did not know the Lord. They didn't know God. And that verse, it tells us that they did not know the works that he had did for Israel, for their people. And so the 11th and the 12th verse of that second chapter of Judges tells us that that generation suffered. We're told that that generation had much tribulation because they didn't know the Lord. They did evil in his eyes. They forsook the Lord and they served idols. They served other gods. Now, prior to that generation doing that, again, Moses had said to the children of Israel that when their children would ask them about the meaning of the testimonies, the statutes and the judgments, they want to tell their children all about it. They were to tell their children all about what God had did for them. They were to teach them to observe God's commandments. Somebody may wonder, well, why? Why were they supposed to do that? Why do you think they were supposed to do that? You see, their intent, I believe, was very clear. The intent was for a future generation to know the Lord. It was for them to to know the principles and, and the values to live by that will please God that will lead them to being blessed in favor in the eyes of God. They were to know those sayings of old as Aunt tried to jump to him at the end of the Sunday school lesson today. So Moses had said for them to do this. And I think that that would lead us to begin to wonder, how could a generation of Israel rise up and not know the Lord. Now I can think of a couple of reasons Mm -hmm. as to how this would happen. And I want to, I want y'all to understand that I'm pulling these reasons from what I see happening in the world today, because it's happening Mm -hmm. right now today. Mm -hmm. The first reason that I can think of is that the wealth of wisdom and knowledge about the Lord, it wasn't passed down as it should have been. That, that generation should have trained up another generation. Yeah, yeah. And so 
How could a generation rise up and not know the Lord? Well, maybe, just maybe, they weren't taught to know the Lord. Maybe, just maybe. And if that was the case, that would have been a tragic case. Uh, a generation not teaching, not training up another generation. Now, the second reason I can think of would be that a generation did try to teach and train up that future generation. But the future generation heard what that old generation had to say and say, I know, I know a better way. And they decided to go the way that they thought was the better way. And look what happened to them. Again, a generation rose up, didn't know the Lord, and they suffered and went through much tribulation. If you go through the book of Judges, you'll see this endless cycle of ups and downs of the Israelites. As they did evil in the sight of God, and then they would turn around and they would finally please the Lord, only to go back into not knowing the Lord and doing evil in the sight of God. And again, I tell you, if that was the case, if a generation actually gave, they imparted with the wisdom that they had, but another generation, that future generation said, I oh, know I ignored that. We know better than y'all. That would have been a tragedy on that future generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This thought, it made me wonder whether or not we, the collective church today, it made me wonder whether or not we are failing a future generation. It made me wonder whether or not we are failing them or whether or not they are failing themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about my own generation. Right. I'm a millennial. I'm talking about my generation as well. Mm -hmm. Either way, I would tell you that the onus is on all of us as sincere believers. The onus is on all of us who are now elders in the faith. And I don't mean that you're an elder by your age. I'm calling you an elder because you have been on that walk of faith for a long time now. The onus is on us to impart the wealth that we have stored up within us so that the future generation, they can make a choice because that's what life is all about, a choice. We can't take the choice away from them. We must, again, impart our wisdom because the choice lies with them. They can either listen to, heed our wisdom and follow our wisdom, or they can go another way. Now, if we aren't willing to impart our spiritual wealth, then we fail ourselves. We fail ourselves, we fail all of those that are around us, we fail that future generation, and we fail the Lord as well. You see, there is a great danger, I say to you today, of history repeating itself with a generation rising up and not knowing the Lord. This means that such a generation would rise up, they would not know the Lord, and they would suffer just as those who did in the book of Judges. They would suffer. They would undergo great suffering. They would undergo great tribulation. Now, some, including myself, would say that history has sadly already started to repeat itself. By that, what I mean by that, that there is already a growing amount of people that don't know the Lord today. Somebody say, oh man, everybody know God. I would say to them, everybody know of God, but everybody ain't in fellowship with the Lord today. And that, I say to you, is a tragedy. Even within the church, we see it within the church today. Not everybody is in fellowship with the Lord. Again, we see it in the church today where generations are disappearing from the church or they're not present at all. And when I say the church, I'm not talking about the local congregation. When I'm saying the church, I'm talking about the collective church. 
the collective congregation of all of those that believe in the Lord. There are generations that are going missing today in the collective church. Yes, they may have made a choice, but again, the onus is on us to keep moving forward and imparting that spiritual wealth that we have gained so that they can know what true wealth is so that they can have an opportunity to gain it. We can't stop imparting the wealth that we have because we believe many aren't listening today. Like I said last week, there are many out there that desires, that desires to have the wealth of wisdom, knowledge, and faith that you have. You see, Paul, he wrote to Timothy about a day coming when many would no longer endure sound doctrine. Paul said to Timothy that many would turn their ears away from the divine truth for fables. There are many people that are living by a fable today. You see, fables, you know, nursery rhymes, they always, they always had a good end, and most of them did anyway. And there are many people today that, that believe that all that they're gaining in the world, the riches of the world, they are believing a fable, believing that they will find contentment when in actuality they won't. The happiness, the riches of this world, as we know, is temporary. Which is why Jesus said to us that we should lay up our treasures in that which is again heavenly. It truly is sad how so many are missing out on contentment today. Because they're searching for something that cannot be gained through worldly means. However, as I said last week, we who have become elders in this walk of faith, it's time for us to get up and carry out our assignment. Right. We have stored up a great deal of wealth mm -hmm. in how to endure and how to persevere and in finding contentment and finding the joy of life. It is time for us to impart our wealth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, I ask you today, what are you doing with all that spiritual wealth that you have stored up? through all those trials and those tribulations that you have gone through, through knowing that you can make it. What are you doing with that wealth, that wisdom that you have? In knowing how to go and take possession of a blessing. What are you doing with that wisdom, that knowledge that you have stored up? Are you keeping it to yourself or are you sharing it? You see, those who are of the world and they gain their, their material riches, they live by the principle of being stingy with theirs. If they ain't stingy, they're greedy, and then they'll be even more stingy once they get. We, as believers, we ain't supposed to be that way. See, the principles and the values that we live by is that we are supposed to minister, that we are supposed to share. As I said last week, all of us are preachers. We can all testify of what God has did for us. So we'll see this here in the 78th Psalm. We'll see there in the 78th Psalm where we read a Psalm of Asaph here. Well, the psalmist speaks of the history of Israel from Jacob to David. Now within this Psalm, we will see where the psalmist, the psalmist had a clear desire for the word of God to be made known, especially to the children as well. You see, if you go over this psalm in its entirety, you'll see that the psalmist didn't want anybody to forget God. He didn't want history. He didn't want history to repeat itself. And so in the opening of the psalm, we'll see there in the first verse where the psalmist called for Israel to be attentive to their words. The psalmist had some wisdom to share. Did not want anyone to miss out on the wisdom. Again, just to be clear, we have a wealth of treasure that again, like this psalmist, we must be willing to share. We must go out and tell somebody, be attentive to, to my words, to the words, the wisdom that I have to share with you. 
So what was the wealth of wisdom that the psalmist had to share? We'll see there in the second verse that the psalmist said that they would speak in a parable and utter dark sayings of old. Dark there, we should understand that meant hidden. All right. These sayings of old, the psalmist was saying they weren't supposed to be hidden any longer especially to the future generation, to the children as well. We'll see there in the fourth verse that these sayings that they would praise God's strength and his wonderful works. The psalmist again wanted the people, wanted the children especially to know God, to know his works as well. In as we saw in our Sunday school lesson last week, when you have knowledge, when you have wisdom of God and the works that, that he does, it can encourage not just you, but it can encourage those that don't know him, that don't know his works. Again, let us remember Rahab. Rahab was of Jericho. She didn't know God. She didn't know God until she was told about God parting the Red Sea. When she heard about the power, the might of the Lord, the works that, that he was doing for Israel and that Israel was enjoying success, Rahab said, man, I need to go and get me some of this. And, and she began to believe. Again, I tell you that we have a wealth of wisdom that Somebody, when they hear what God has done for you, they may go and say to themselves, man, I need to get some of that as well. I need to eat of some of your fruit as well. Again, you got long lasting fruit. They may say of you, man, that fruit, it tastes good. Let me eat some more of it. Yeah. And I tell you today, don't be stingy with the wealth of wisdom that you have to share in part what it is that you have stored up within you. Mm -hmm. Now we'll get down to the first of my key verses there in the sixth verse. We'll see that the testimonies of old, they again, they were to be taught to the future generation. And then that generation would pass on their testimonies to the next. Right. Yeah. Again, as Unc said, you know, the walls of Jericho coming down, that used to be preached about back in the day. That's right. That's Not so much anymore. Mm -hmm. you know, many of us, we, we stray off to, to preaching about gaining wealth, prosperity, yeah. that is of the world, yeah. rather than gaining true wealth mm -hmm. that is of the heavenly and gaining heaven. Mm -hmm. You see, that's what I'm all about. I want to gain heaven. Come on. Come on. I want you to gain heaven. Yeah. I want you to have a true inheritance. That is of uh, true wealth. In the second of the key verses there in the seventh verse, we'll see that the wealth of those testimonies were to set the hopes of the future generations to trust in God, yeah, yeah. to hope in him. And when those sayings of old, when they will be said and when they will be believed, when they will trust in it, they, the future generations, they wouldn't suffer. They wouldn't go through great tribulation. They would prosper. That is what I want for the people living today and the people that will live tomorrow. I want all of you and I want them to prosper. See, one of the things that worries me today is that the future generations are being trained up to know everything but the Lord. They're being trained up to prosper, but they're being trained up to prosper in the world. Rather than prospering in the eyes of God, which do you think is more important? Prospering in the world or prospering in the eyes of God? I don't know about you, but I rather, I much rather prosper in the eyes of God than prosper in the world. My treasure again is heaven. That's where my wealth is being stored up. My wealth is not going to fade away. In order to prevent 
what happened to the generation of Israel that forgot God. Again, I say to you today that we must impart our spiritual wealth. We must impart those sayings of old to those that are willing to listen. Though many may turn away from our testimonies, I say to you today that we must continue to have the courage to be faithful. We must have the courage to act on our faith, not just sit down. We must have the courage to take on the assignment that God has given to us. We must have the courage to impart our wisdom. Don't be afraid to share your testimony. Don't be afraid to share those sayings of old. Don't be afraid to let somebody know that God parted the Red Sea. Don't be afraid to let somebody know that God parted a Red Sea in your life. Don't be afraid to let somebody know that God is taking you over all kinds of, of hills and mountains in your life. Don't be afraid to let somebody know that he brought you through the valley of the shadow of death and that you have success, that you have victory, that you are blessed today because of what God has done for you. There again, I say to you, is somebody that needs to hear that from you today. There is somebody that needs that wealth of wisdom that you have for being able to persevere through all that life throws your way. When your body starts to decay, when your body wants to give out, when you're like me and your kidneys tried to destroy you, but you still standing strong in, in this world today. And you can testify of what God has done. There is somebody. There is somebody that needs that word today, that needs that good word, that needs that strength, that needs that encouragement, that needs that wealth so that they can live by that wealth today and be able to live by it tomorrow. Why would you keep that wealth shut up, stored up within you? God hasn't blessed you with that wealth for you to be stingy with it. God has given to you for you to share. Do you believe me today? You see, if you believe me today, then you will impart what you have. We have true wealth. And in the true wealth we have, we have generational wealth. We have wealth that can be inherited by our children and our children's children and then the generations that come after them. We have a wealth that can be stored up in their hearts that they can live by today and be able to live by when we have been called out of this world by the Lord. And I tell you that there is nothing in the world that is greater than that. Someone living by the word of God, someone knowing the Lord, not having forgotten him and in knowing the Lord, not suffering great tribulation, but rather being blessed and highly favored in the eyes of God. So I tell you today that we must be ready. We must be ready to do, to share the assignment, to share our wealth with all of those that are around us. We must be ready to do just as those that did that, that came before us. I know the Lord today because my mom knows the Lord. My dad knows the Lord. My aunts, my uncles, my grandparents, they, they know the Lord. They knew the Lord. And they were trained up because again, the apostles sat before Christ and Christ shared an inheritance with them. He imparted his wealth onto them. You see, again, all of those in the world today, all of those in the world tomorrow, they again can be blessed and highly favored if we do just as Jesus did for us. We are to shine as lights in the world. We are to impart the divine truth to all of those that are around us. And in that divine truth, they have hope. Again, they will be blessed today and then they will inherit the kingdom of God. So let us do what God has called us to do. Let us walk worthy of our calling 
and let us bestow some good principles and values for all those around us, especially our children, to live by. Amen. 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 Amen.